This is the OTB Television Network. They're into the stretch, and John Velasquez says, let's go, Uncle Mo. Rattlesnake Briz tries to stick with him. They've left the others far behind. Uncle Mo has a two-length lead at the 16th pole, and he's opened up from Rattlesnake Bridge. Uncle Mo is back. His three-year-old debut was a winning one. He took it by four and a half lengths over Rattlesnake Bridge. Gallant Dreams was third, and Rocking Out finished fourth. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. Along with my colleague Mike Veach, the racing columnist with the Saratoga, and I'm Mark Asano, welcoming you to this morning's program. And as per usual, a busy one in front of us. We will take a look at the eagerly anticipated, and you just saw a piece of it, three-year-old debut of Uncle Mo and the Timely Writer. We'll look at a shocker in the Tampa Bay Turby. Quite a two-turn debut out at Santa Anita in the San Felipe. We will update our list of our top Kentucky Derby prospects, and then we will welcome in a pair of special guests, both gentlemen from Oaklawn Park with runners in this afternoon's Rebel, Mr. Donnie Von Hemmel, who has alternation, an impressive allowance winner over the track and last, as well as Caleb's posse, who uh, had a troubled trip in the Southwest and last. And then coming in from Southern California, Mr. Jeff Bondi, who brings in Sway Away, who's never been two turns for this afternoon's Rebel. So all of that and much, much more if you stay with us for this, our March 19th edition of the program on this final <laughs> official day of winter. Hallelujah. Stress the word official. <laughs> who knows where we're going, but looking forward to both guests today for... Donnie and mine, uh, gosh, go way back to talking with him when he brought Clever sure. Trevor to Saratoga. And Mark's interesting piece, which interests me, he's always bringing up whether or not a, a brilliant one-turn sprinter can go two turns. I think that's the fun of this oh, afternoon. Yeah. I really liked him that day uh, in the one-turn race against the Factor, but uh, we'll have to see how it goes today. But uh, gosh, yeah. Oakland's race today is just a lot of fun. It that's is. all I can say. It, is. it really is. It really is. is. Um, there were two early scratches out of the race. We just had our associate producer, Julie Hoxie, call Oakland to see if there were any other scratches because I'll tell you, the Louisiana Derby is a week from today. It's a million bucks, and there's not much there. So I, I, I don't understand what some of these guys are doing, to be very, very honest. Uh, I think the Rebel, because of the size of its field, and because of the potential of the factor in Sway Away and a couple of others, might be just about as difficult a spot as the Louisiana Derby. And the Louisiana Derby's a million dollars next uh, yeah. week. Oh, yeah. So, so we will see. Mm. Uh, first of all, good luck to all the participants in this weekend's Winter Handicapping Challenge at the Albany Telethater. Good luck to all. If you haven't signed up, you know, and you've got nothing to do this weekend, and you'd like to participate, you know what? Stop over at the Teletheater. You may be able to sign up uh, prior to the event. And for those of you who are Capital Bets account holders, next week, a big week for you because you will earn double rewards points on your wagers on the Aqueduct races next week, Wednesday through Sunday. In case you missed it on last week's show, our friend and colleague Bill Heller has written his 22nd book. It is on Jose Santos, The Turbulent Life of Jose Santos, and that's going to be a very good read. And to order Bill's book, go to josesantosbook.com, and you can order it right online, The Turbulent Life of Jose Santos, at josesantosbook.com. Really great human interest it story sure out of Santa Anita. 
John Shear, and that name probably isn't terribly familiar, John is a paddock guard at Santa Anita who recently became somewhat of a hero. Last Saturday, a horse got loose in the paddock in Arcadia and was running toward a six-year-old girl. The 90-year-old Shear jumped in front of the girl to shield her. The horse crashed into him, causing multiple fractures. His face was black and blue. He lost a significant amount of blood. But the good news, along with the fact that the girl is absolutely safe, thanks to John Shear, is that John Shear is on the improve. He may or may not need surgery. He has worked at Santa Anita for the last 49 years and can't wait to get back to work. How great is that he story? He is the most important, important and significant employee at Santa How Anita great. Race Course. How great is that? <laughs> So, John, thank you uh, and congratulations, yep. and we wish you all the best. More news out of Santa Anita. Game on Do, the somewhat controversial winner of the Santa Anita Handicap, will be forced to bypass next Saturday's Dubai World Cup. Game on Dude has, according to his trainer, Bob Baffert, something in his foot. Baffert said it looks like an abscess mm -hmm. ready to pop. So, Game on Dude will be forced to miss that 10 million dollar <laughs> event wow all right three-year-old news santiva a solid second behind mucho macho man in the risen star in his 2011 debut in last will bypass the million dollar louisiana derby as most three-year-olds will fortunately the eddie Keneally trainee will instead race in the bluegrass on the poly track at keeneland for his final kentucky derby prep now folks the louisiana derby at a million bucks that's the first time a race at the fairgrounds has ever been worth a million. And a lot of people think when you raise purses or get them to that level, there's automatically going to be a stampede to the racing office to run. That will not be the case for the Louisiana Well, Dirt. in this instance, <clears throat> there should be, but I agree with you. Sometimes that doesn't happen, but there are sure no killers at, at Louisiana down, at, at uh, fairgrounds for a million dollars. And Santiva's going to where he ran in the Breeders' Fraternity last fall, but, you know, I thought his race down there was pretty good. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't, you know, wow. It's, it's Mucho this Macho really Man a, and Nation, and, and, yeah. and, you know, yep. that's, that's yep. about it. Sweet Ducky. Second behind dialed in in the Holy Bull and last has been sold. Originally pointing for the Florida Derby, Sweet Ducky was purchased specifically to run in next Saturday's UAE Derby mm -hmm. in Dubai. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, Sweet Ducky has never run on synthetic, and his best races have been up to a mile. Isn't it a little odd that you would buy a horse specifically <laughs> for a race on a surface that the Colt has never run well, over. Well, I think maybe it, 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 the president of Chechen, if we're saying that correctly, I think it's great that we have someone like that in racing, but uh, maybe the long-term goal is the Russian Derby, in which case that answers your question. Yeah, it, I mean, yes, yes. I want to see that race. Yes, we I want video. The, no, no, the Russian Derby, oh, the not Russian, the UAE yeah. Derby. Okay, <laughs> you, you'll have to wait a while to see that. Actually, the UAE Derby will be during our show next uh, week. Next week. I think it's a 1025 post time. Okay, Garrett Gomez has gotten the mount on to honor and serve for the Florida Derby and possibly beyond. With Johnny V committed to Uncle Mo, obviously, Billy Mott needed a rider. Garrett Gomez was available, so he will be aboard next, um, for his next race in the Florida Derby on Sunday, April 3rd. Good choice. I think good it's a choice. very good yep. choice. Some sad news. Fort Hughes, yes, the is. winner of the Jimmy Wink Winkfield Stakes, broke down during a workout last Sunday in New York and was euthanized. He was a Darley Colt trained by Kieran, who had been pointing for the Bay Shore on the Wood undercard. And speaking of the Wood Memorial, quarter million dollars has been added to the purse. Uh, Genting is a presenting sponsor. It's now a $1 million race, and with Uncle Mo headed there, it might not be much of a bigger field than the Louisiana Derby, but nonetheless, I think that's good news. And it really reflects what I describe as an emerging relationship between Genting and the New York Racing Association that I think is very healthy. The race will now be called the Resorts World New York Casino 
Wood Memorial kind of just rolls off the tongue. And it goes from three quarters of a million to a million. Yeah. And the most important thing about that might be that whoever runs second to Uncle Mo, if he goes there, gets 220,000 now. <laughs> that might serious. be the most that important That might be thing. a top 20 number. <laughs> okay, speaking of Uncle Mo, let's go to the races. We begin with a timely record. <clears throat> the eagerly anticipated three-year-old debut of last year's champ. He is number one in here. Watch as the gates open. He comes out a yep. bit. Number two, Gallant Dreams broke inward, causing the two to bump. Well, that turned out to be the only time during the next one minute, 36.56 seconds, that Uncle Mo was in any jeopardy. As I mentioned last week, with the scratch of the speedy madman diaries, Uncle Mo would be facing four rivals, none of whom had any real early speed. So it was very likely he would be able to waltz on the front end. Well, I don't know if there's a dance slower than the waltz, but with these early fractions of 25 and 2, 49 and 2, and 13 and 3, Uncle Mo would turn this into a quarter mile sprint. And with the final two furlongs in a blazing 22 and 4, mm -hmm. the unbeaten son of Indian Charlie would win off by three and three quarter lengths over Rattlesnake Bridge, who, despite the crawling pace, was the only horse to go after Uncle Mo at any point in this so-called race. So partner, on the surface, a very, very nice comeback for the champ. Oh yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, y you know, I, I was hoping we'd see him somewhere else. And look, he's got a, a great trainer here in Todd. We don't want to doubt that. But I would say that the teaching aspect of this race is almost priceless. Your number of coming home the last quarter and that figure is just really, he's, st he's still doing it without really turning a hair. and. Uh, just my opinion here, this is kind of what he has to do pedigree-wise for the 10 furlongs, if he can manage to do this and have that left at the end. But, um, you know, uh, I, I would say a more, a more enjoyable uh, thing to watch for me as a, a, a fan of derby horses as opposed to dialed in's um, confusing to me thing a couple of weeks ago. This is a terrific return, no doubt about it. Well, I thought off the layoff, one of the most overlooked aspects of this race, let's face it, Uncle Moet too was a very precocious young horse Definitely. who had a lot of speed. Oh, we've seen it. He you know. relaxed yes. so beautifully in here and Johnny didn't have to strangle him. He was very, very relaxed to go that slow. That's very positive. After a final quarter, and you see Johnny's not asking for very much, after a final quarter mile in 22 and 4, he would gallop out very strongly an extra eighth of a mile. That is another positive. But I got to tell you, yeah. while this race unfolded exactly the way I expected it to, with Madman Diaries out of there, mm -hmm. it was completely atypical of a normal horse race. 25 and 2 under no pressure, 49 and 2 under no pressure. I mean, how much good does that type of race do for well, you when you're going to be looking at an 18, 19, <coughs> 20 horse field on the first Saturday in May? It's, it's a very fair question, okay? Um, he's responsible for his horse only. Um, I, again, think that the teaching aspect of this was very important. Um, obviously, he's going to be in, in, you know, like you say, 18 or 19 opponents there. But this is what they wanted for his return. Um, I think you have to do something like this for him to get 10 furlongs. We've been in this game too long. We've seen a whole lot of horses come down the pike and do what he did at two and not grow at three. My preference would be for a couple of real tough races going into the derby. That's my preference, yes. okay? The other way to look at it is, and for me this is a fun question, the other way to look at it is, he knows, the horse knows, that they're so superior that this is the long-term strategy to get through the Triple Crown. We're not gonna know that till derby right. day, okay? Right. From your point in mind, I'd like to see him get hooked in the eye with a quarter mile left and see what's left on his side. but. 
this could be one of those rare, rare, rare instances yep. where the, where this guy is really yes. the lord of the crop. Yes. If he is, this is what you want to come back at. If I just he, none of us he, know until May seventh. If he's so, <laughs> so superior, that's it. That's fine. I know. I know. Now, I know. If he goes in the wood, it's possible that he crawls twenty five. I think it's, pro I think it's probable. I think it's who wants to go with them. What good well, does that do on the first Saturday in May? I, let me tell you something. If they go twenty five and two and forty nine and two to first Saturday in May, then I'll put that. Well, that, that's the best the best bet that you can make. I, I agree just, with you. Know, you. I, is, I agree with you. So it was so but, atypical. I'm not sure exactly no. what it does. Other than get him started we're, on his three, we're not campaign. we're not going to be. But if the whole tone of his conditioning through the classics is you're you have to relax to the point where it's a crawl, he responded. Uh, I've seen a couple this year who are not capable of relaxing. Right. So, right. But that's you know. Yeah, that's what this is why it's fun. That, I mean, that actually impressed me know, more than anything. Yeah. The fact that he relaxed. Yeah, we know so he's well. got speed. Right. Exactly. I agree. You know, yeah. being a fresh yeah. horse. Now, yeah. just how slow was that pace? There were three one-mile races run last Saturday at Gulfstream. Let's take a look at the fractions of those three races. Now, the first one on top, where our vicarious <laughs> girl set the pace and ran second, was an optional claimer for fillies and mares. You see Uncle Mo in the Timely Rider, and then you see the amazing Tackleberry in the Gulfstream Park Handicap. Uncle Mo and Tackleberry both went wire to wire. Our vicarious girl led all the way and ran second. We're going to take a quick look and compare Uncle Mo's fractions first to Tackleberry. After a quarter mile, it was nearly a full second slower. After a half mile, it was nearly two full seconds slower. After three quarters, it was exactly two and a half seconds slower than Tackleberry. Yeah. That is unbelievable, agree, yeah. two and a half seconds I slower. Agree. Now, with a final quarter in 22.87, it only ended up being 1.33 seconds slower than Tackleberry, but this gives you an idea what kind of a crawl it was. Yeah. And even if you compare it to the Phillies and Mares in the optional claimer, yeah. they went much faster yeah. earlier. So again, it was impressive that he relaxed so wonderfully. And the 22.87 final quarter was very impressive. So was the gallop out. That was all impressive. Let's face it, he's an impressive racehorse. Oh, yeah. But it was so atypical of a normal style horse race that I really don't know. I really well, don't know I, what I'm going to do. I know. I got, I got you. I mean, I, and okay. I know. So Todd, very, very pleased, obviously, yep. with Uncle Mo's return. Now we go across the state for the Tampa Bay Derby. And Todd is represented by number 10 brethren, the odds-on favorite. Easy winner of the Sam F. Davis over the track and last in his 2011 debut. This appeared to be, you know, at least to me on paper, somewhat of a formality. And for the first six furlongs of this eight and a half furlong contest, brethren appeared as though, you know, he was going to win as expected. Then a funny thing happened on the way to the far turn and the head of the stretch. Number nine, Watch Me Go, a 43-to-1 shot who finished a non-threatening third in the Sam Davis, and number six, Crimson Knight, who was claimed for all of 16,000 out of his last race, started to make brethren work harder than expected. And then, totally unexpectedly, Brethren simply spit the bit, tiring to finish a poor third, as Watch Me Go would outgame twice his price, Crimson Knight, to shock the Tampa Bay Derby. Partner to me, <laughs> yeah. this performance by Brethren yeah. bordered on too bad to believe. I guess you have to rank it that way. Um, one of the post-race remarks was he's not accustomed to being on the lead that early. Well, you still have to be classy enough to just simply get these guys beat if you're brethren. Uh, that it happened at Tampa, I guess it's not too much of a shock. He's going to the whip here at the top of the stretch. Um, 
the Kathleen O'Connell thing, getting it done, that do, that's not a total shock to me. She's a heck of a good trainer, and she kept the faith that they're being third in the Davis. Uh, the 16 claimer uh, applying all the pressure. <laughs> yes. that, that's the stuff that really does bother me here. So I, 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 I concur. Uh, it's best to forget this. Uh, for whatever reason, he surely couldn't have bou <laughs> bounced off of the cakewalk in, in the last race. <laughs> so I, mean, I know, was, I know. It's this, just, this was dreadful. It's a it great, it's a great game. I, I know a couple folks who were there who are, were in in awe and shock after this, or shock and awe after it. So, so watch me go. Owned <laughs> by longtime owner Gilbert Campbell, Gilbert Campbell trained yeah. by Kathleen O'Connell, and ridden by Luis Garcia. Congratulations to the connections. Out game Crimson Knight. How about the claim for sixteen thousand? Oh boy! I don't know what second money was, but you know what? What's the purse? Tw well, it's twenty percent. So they got uh, set. What well, they get? Seventy thousand. They claimed them for sixteen. Yeah. They run them. They grabbed yeah. seventy thousand. Yeah. Congratulations. Good going. All right. Finally, the San Felipe at Santa Anita, an interesting combination of some lightly raced to differing degrees sprinters stretching out and those horses who had already gone two turns. In the end, it would be one of those stretch out sprinters who would absolutely dominate. Watch number six, Premier Pegasus in the purple silks, taking blinkers off in an attempt to get him to relax in his two turn debut. And apparently, that worked to perfection. With sprinters Albert Gotti and run flat out, along with the veteran comma to the top, going crazy up front, 21 and 3, 44 and 2, and 108 and 4. Alonzo Quinones, who hadn't ridden a winner in his last 69 mounts, would sit very patiently and with about 5 sixteenths of a mile to go, would set down the son of Derby hero Fusaichi Pegasus they would gobble up the exhausted leaders and go on to a very impressive seven and three quarter length score in the San Felipe. Jay Cito, <laughs> who also sat well off this ludicrous pace, finished a suck up second. But it was all Premier Pegasus in quite a two-turn debut. This is called swooping down from the rafters and just humiliating and decimating <laughs> your foes. I mean, here he comes rolling right now. This is really quite a sight to see. Uh, at, at some point in January, I think I said to Mark, I was wondering where Premier Pegasus was, and here he is right now flying home, pun intended. And uh, I was also wondering about uh, last fall when I liked him in the Hollywood preview. I think that was the race. Uh, if you've got the PPs there, I think that was, uh, he was unbeaten through three, if yep. I'm not mistaken. I was wondering why uh, owner, breeder, trainer Myung Kwon Cho said that he was going to point this guy for turf. I did a lot of pedigree searching and did find Trojan bronze in there. So, I mean, he won the San Luis Rey. But all of this stuff is now uh, uh, inklings of the past and wonderings in the past. This is one of the breakthrough performances of this classic season. Blinkers off, first two-tune race, just hits him square in the eyes. He clearly loved it. And to me, it vaults him right into the Santa Anita Derby scene, and it vaults him on my list as well. I thought this was hugely impressive. Uh, I liked him last fall, and I'm, I'm not being, a, you know, just kind of, you know, any asides here. I wondered where he was until he came back in, in the sprint. Was it the factor? I, I, yes, yeah, in the San Vicente. Factor. Yeah, in the San Vicente. Yeah. He flattened so, out a little you bit you know, that day to finish third. So uh, the family is very, very good for the classics. The, the speed is there from the Mr. Prospector side, and this is just flat out dominant. That really was. And uh, congratulations to Myung Quan Cho, the owner, breeder, uh, he's listed as the trainer, but his assistant, Maria Ayala, does the training. The blinkers off really did the job. And, you know, if you're going to break an 0 for 69 streak, it may as well be in the San Felipe. I didn't even know that. And Alonzo Quinones <laughs> so. sat there patiently. Now, listen, we all know that the race fell into his lap, except yeah. could have fallen into the lap of any horse who was rallying from way off the pace. You know what, folks? With about three-eighths of a mile to go, Jay Cito was only about two lengths behind Premier Pegasus. Yeah. Okay? 
sitting just as good yeah. a trip. And Jay Cito got beat seven and three quarters. Now, Jay Cito, they had taken the blinkers off him, and Baffert said he didn't focus very well, so they're going to put the blinkers back on him for the Santa Anita Derby. I don't think you'll see the blinkers back on Premier Pegasus for a very, very <laughs> long time. You know, ridiculous early pace. Uh, the closers did benefit, but I got to tell you, I thought that was a wonderful, it was one of the wonderful ones this spring. performance. Yes. Okay, so we took a look at the comeback of Uncle Mo. By the way, is there a dance slower than the waltz? Uh, but I don't know. You're asking the wrong okay. guy on that. So we, we see the comeback of Uncle Mo. We see uh, Brethren, you know, just spit the bit in the Tampa Bay Derby. And we see Premier Pegasus romp in the San Felipe. We've digested those races and others. And for the first time since February 5th, here's a look at Michael's updated list of his top Kentucky Derby prospects. Well, there's uh, no changes at the top, that's for sure. And uh, I've got Uncle Mo in, in the first spot and to honor and serve in the second. Um, you know, I mean, after the strenuous, timely writer, what can I say? But, uh, you know, throwing the cynicism aside, he is still the brilliant member of this crop. I'm going to be very faithful to the guy in the second spot. I'm looking for a, a much better effort in the Florida Derby and a much better effort than that in the Derby. The big jump for me is putting Premier Pegasus number third. I was, I was taken away by this. Uh, if he does anything like this again in the Santa Anita oh. Derby, going a mile and an eighth, he's going to go to Louisville. And people are going to be saying, you know, this guy may have a chance to knock off the champ. Solda, what can I say? I mean, I, I think I said it after the last race. If he does well in the Florida Derby and wins, he goes to Churchill with three nine yep. furlong victories. Nobody else is even close on that count. Stay Thirsty joins after the Gotham. Dialed in, I've bumped down a little bit uh, simply because I'm still confused about that. Sway Away joins my list. We look at him today. Mucho Macho Man from Louisiana. Santiva, who's really been steady for me all the way. I bumped Brethren, and I put Gourmet Dinner here in my top ten, although we know at this time that we don't know what the plans are for him, and yeah, that's a fact. Yeah. My honorable mention list, and it kind of maybe reflects that I'm starting to uh, think that maybe other than a couple here, this may not be as strong a crop like Mark has pointed out a couple times since New Year's Day. You know, astrology's got to get going. I'm interested in Arch, Arch, Arch this afternoon. I did like him the last out. Um, and the factor is there because uh, he might do something this afternoon. But it's the top two for me and the new guy, Premier Pegasus. All right, Michael's <clears throat> a list of top derby prospects now. Let's take a look at mine, and you will see in parentheses the rankings for these horses. We've only done two lists prior to today. They were on January 1st and February 5th. So let's take a look at my top Kentucky Derby prospects. Dialed in remains number one. Uh, I am absolutely convinced that Nick Zito is attempting to get him to absolutely peak on the first Saturday in May. He hasn't had a workout since his last race. His only work, serious work, for the Florida Derby will be next week. By the way, I do not expect Dialed In to win the Florida Derby. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't. I think, he's got a, I think he's got a better chance to win the Kentucky Derby than the Florida Derby. Mm -hmm. He was fifth on my first list, and he was first on my second list. The only, and, and the, the, knock is not the proper word, the only concern I have about Uncle Mo, who is absolutely brilliant, is he's an Indian Charlie. There is some legitimate concern about a mile and a quarter this early in his career. And he will only have 17 furlongs worth of races in six months going into the Derby. And they might be the easiest 17 furlongs you could ever have. I don't particularly think that's a great way to go. So that is number three. He was number eight on my last list. To honor and serve only drops a, a notch. He was second and third on the earlier list. He's now number four. Mucho Macho Man was very high on my original list, then dropped because he didn't rate well in the Holy Bull. Well, he rated very, very well when he won the Risen Star. The very good news about Mucho Macho Man for me is he's one of three horses on this list who could earn me a cigar from my partner oh, from our original I, derby I actually list. Forgot. That's the good news. <laughs> okay. The not so good news for me is that the presence of Mucho Macho Man has caught 
the eyes of a group of, and I use this term loosely, musicians from the 1970s. <laughs> yeah. I never thought I would ever be showing a photo of the village people on this program. <laughs> the village people, one of their big hits was Macho Man, and they have now jumped on the Mucho Macho Man bandwagon. So if this cult makes it to the first Saturday in May for Kathy Ritvo, you will likely see the village oh, people. Oh, they're, they're on TV. Oh, yes. The village people <laughs> at historic Churchill Downs. At number six is Premier Pegasus. Seven is Santiva. Eight is Anthony's Cross. Anthony to Derby next for him. Rogue Romance is number nine. You know, for me to put Sway away this high without him ever having gone two turns should give you some kind of an idea what I think about his potential. And we're going to find out much more about him later this afternoon in The Rebel. Brethren was dreadful. It was so bad to believe. <coughs> I'm going to keep him there and give him one more chance. Machen in the Louisiana Derby. Jay Cito was really not a very good suck-up second in the San Felipe, but they're going to put blinkers back on him. The factor is very tough to rate. He's, according to Baffert, he's got to win this afternoon yeah. to stay on the derby yeah. trail. He may be talented enough to carry his speed. I'm just not sure. Stay thirsty, one at Aqueduct. He's going to be facing much, much tougher in the Florida Derby. If he goes to the Florida Derby and Uncle Mo goes to the wood, I'm not absolutely convinced that's going to happen. Astrology is going to go next to the Sunland Derby. Bowman's Causeway is running today for $55,000 yeah. in an allowance race. He could not only run next week for a million in the Louisiana Derby, but he could be a major, major factor. But they're running for $55,000 this afternoon. And finally, for a lot of young people, nachos and beer adds up to a gourmet dinner. So that rounds out the top 20. <clears throat> but I've still got dialed in on top. And again, I don't expect them to win the Florida Derby. All right. We are up to our first break on this March 19th edition of the program. Thank you so much for having joined us. When Michael and I return, we will welcome in our first guest of the morning, Mr. Donnie Von Hemmel. As we go to this break, the Santa Margarita, last Saturday at Santa Anita, the 90 cent to a dollar favorite, switch number four. Stretching out to a distance she had never won at. The coast, second choice is at two and a half to one. Number two, the speedy always a princess, and number three, St. Trinian's. So we'll take a look at a piece of the Santa Margarita going to the break. Michael and I will be back with Donnie Von Hemmel right after these messages. Past the three eights they go now, and it's still always a princess. Here's Switch to take her on early, and Switch kicks for home, puts the pressure on always a princess. It's four lengths back to Vision in goal. St. Trinian's is back in the four spot at the top of the lane, and it's Switch and always a princess only a head apart. Vision in goal, St. Trinian's coming after them third and fourth. Homeward bound in a Santa Margarita, and Switch strikes the front. And it's Switch to Always a Princess. Vision in gold shifting out. They come for home and Switch goes on with it. Switch the leader. Late run from Mismatch. Mismatch, a big long shot coming out of nowhere. Swiss, Mitch, Match. They hit the wire. Close, I think. Mismatch might have caused the upset. Switch is right there. Vision in gold a close third. St. Trinian's was four. <laughs> This is the OTB Television Network.
Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. Mike Veach to my left. I'm Mark Asano. And Miss Match, who, to be perfectly frank, wasn't yeah. that much back here in the East last year, shipped to Neil Drysdale and under Garrett Gomez, shocked the Santa Margarita at 45-1 to 1 by a head over switch. I don't think Joel Rosario showed enough patience with that Philly stretching out. They may both, or at least one of them, go to the apple blossom. Always a princess who uh, set the pace pulled up she fell she broke the bottom half of both sesamoids mm. now she's undergone successful surgery she's retired but apparently will be all right okay to introduce our first guest of the morning who has a pair of runners for this afternoon's rebel here's michael and our first guest today is gonna we hope play a key part in the rebel today which is a fascinating race on the on the trail to Kentucky and it's at the very popular Oaklawn Park and this is coming up a wonderful race again. So uh, Donnie Von Hemmel, if you're with us, welcome back to Down the Stretch in upstate New York with Michael Veach and Mark Cusano. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. It's uh, it'll be my first on uh, on your your network, I guess. We're we're glad to have you with us, Donnie. And you're going to go with Alternation and Caleb's Posse. Let's talk about Alternation first today in the Rebel. Um, you just kind of tell us about Alternation. I mean, it's a stakes debut. He's got a pedigree to die for. You know, we've watched a couple of his races. He seems to settle early and get in a groove. How is Alternation to train, and and how does he take to his training? Yeah, he's, he's real good to train. He's been uh, uh, no problem at all in the morning. He's, uh, he's a big, good-looking colt, mm -hmm. and, and uh, if he wanted to be, he could be a problem. He, <laughs> he's uh, <laughs> a lot of horse there, but I tell you what, he's, he's easy going around the barn, and he, and he really handles things well and, and uh, has, has really uh, done what we wanted him to, especially this last month. We've, we've gotten through most of the bad weather. And, yeah. And we've really gotten to work when we wanted to and how we wanted to and stuff uh, this last month. So looking forward to uh, his next debut today. Donnie, we certainly are, too. His last two works on paper look awfully good. Uh, the 5 and 59 and uh, Monday the half and 48 on a wet track. Donnie, talk about those, those works as far as your expectations for him. Yeah, the, the five eighths work. I did uh, break a colt off in front of him uh, about five lengths uh, from the from the pole, and uh, he he actually dropped back. He was probably seven or eight back at one point, and then at the quarter pole, uh, he came and gathered him up pretty pretty quickly, and and we gave him a little room on the inside to come through mm -hmm. on, and uh, finished up real nice down the lane, galloped out strong, and uh, and the the half mile work this week. We, I was looking for probably 49 and change, and and without looking at the watch, you would have thought that he's he's just kind of a big, long striding colt. You, you would have thought probably 49 and change, but uh, again, a real nice work, and then should set him up good for today. Gosh, that's really exciting. We're going to take a look right now, Donnie, at his allowance victory over older horses on the 21st of February, and we're picking it up right now. He's on the back stretch, and he'll be last at the top of the screen. Uh, talk about this performance, if you will. Yeah, it was, uh, like you said, it was against some older horses, and, and a couple of uh, the two three-year-olds who were in there were actually second and third in the, the previous yeah. stake here at Oklahoma. Yeah. They'd, they'd end up second and third in the race. But he, he looks like he's just kind of cruising along, and you're starting to wonder, you know, what's going to happen. And then when he turns for home and Louis yeah. kind of lets the cut out, clutch out it's just three or four strides and you can tell he's got a, he's got it all handled <laughs> and then just kind of cruises in from there it's it's really it's really wonderful to watch he just sort of does his thing every time he's just so professional and so smooth and they're turning for home right now uh, i'm going to assume because it looks to me like you've been patient and said he's this big guy coming down the middle here now I'm going to assume that along the way this year, this was in the back of your mind, and please tell me if I'm wrong, this was going to be a stakes debut. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we knew, or we felt like he was uh, a, a good enough horse to, mm -hmm. to have some, some say in the three all races. And really, to us, it, it wouldn't matter if it's in the spring, summer, or fall. We just want him to be ready to do it and... Uh, and and not really, uh, you know, put him in spots he's not ready for. And I think with with that last allowance victory, yeah, uh, we we felt like he was ready to step up to this uh, to the rebel. 
Well, Don, you've also got Caleb's Posse this afternoon. This is also a homebred like the first one. And it's not surprising to me when you look at the past performances that a Posse gets to the races in July, but it's a bit surprising to me that a Posse is getting two turns. I'd like you to comment on that. Well, he's, he's been uh, a pretty, pretty easy colt to work with also. Now, maybe not as, as easy to go along with as, as alternation, but he's, uh, I think probably uh, his dam side has probably got a little more stamina mm -hmm. to it also. And uh, he just, he's not a big horse, but he's a well-made horse, got a real efficient way of moving. And, uh, you know, the question will always be there uh, at a mile and eighth, mile and a quarter, what's he going to do? Uh, but I think mile, mile 16th, he's, he's as good a, a colt as there is in the race. And, uh, had some trouble last time, really got stuck on the rail for, for most all of the race. So I, I expect him to come back and run run a, a much improved race this time. We're going to look at that shortly. But before we get to it, Donnie, I did want to ask you, when you look at his past performances, to me, there's only one blemish. It's the race uh, at Remington in the springboard mile. He was favored at 9 to 10 that day. Only bad race on the charts. What happened in that race? Well, that that race was run, uh, it was in December, mm -hmm. and it was yep. late in the evening. It was probably pushing 10, 10 o'clock, okay. and, and some cold weather had hit, and actually the top of the track, the track had started freezing up. Wow. And wow. Uh, most of the horses, uh, if you look at, I think the horses that were 1, 2, 3, were 1, 2, 3 throughout. Okay. And uh, everybody that was behind was getting pelted pretty good. <laughs> wow. Wow. Did not so, know uh, that. That was uh, what we felt was the main reason that we, we didn't perform well that day. Well, the other blemish, it's not really a blemish. You alluded to it a little while back, but it's more like real trouble in the southwest. We're watching that now, Donnie. When they're on the screen, he's six toward the inside at the top of the screen. This is a packed feel. Talk about his race here, you know, despite the trouble. You know, talk about his race and uh, how he came out of it, more important. Yeah, he, did, he came out of it in, in good order. I was, uh, I think it was probably uh, a little easier on him than some of the others in there. Uh -huh. We were just stuck on the rail. Uh, felt like we had to go any further, but and uh, you know, a wall of horses in front of him and JP's gusto beside him, and and they just really just sat there and ate him until until the really the decision had been made on who was going to win the race. And yeah. he finally got out and loped by a couple horses, but that was. Uh, game over by then, and uh, I, like I said, I, I still think a mile and a sixteenth something that he can do, and uh, uh, you know, he had in these California horses, I, I think they're certainly going to be uh, tough to outrun, but as far as the, the local horses, he, he's as good as any of the local horses, I think. Well, Donnie, uh, Mark and I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you for it very much, our audience, and I enjoyed hearing you. We wish you good luck this afternoon, and I hope we get the chance to speak again in a few weeks down the road. Okay, well, thanks for having me on, guys. Okay. Thank you, Donnie. Donnie Von Hemmel, ladies and gentlemen. He's got two interesting he does. horses and a fascinating renewal of the Rebel. All right, we are up to our final break on this March 19th edition of the show. Thank you so much for having joined us. When Michael and I return, our final guest, Mr. Jeff Bondi, will join us. As we go to this break, the Gulfstream Park Handicap, oh boy. a terrific, <laughs> <It really was. laughs> highly competitive race. The two-to-one favorite, uh, number one rule, no bargain from that inside post. There were four others in here who were between three-to-one and six-to-one. So we'll take a look at a piece of the Gulfstream Park Handicap, and Michael and I will be back with Jeff Bondi right after these messages. A 47 and three half mile, it's Tackleberry in front as they go into the far turn. Tisway is right there running in second. Soaring Empire is third, just outside the top two. Rule is down at the rail, two lengths off the lead. Jackson Bend is beginning to move up from behind. He's caught four wide, but Jackson Bend is coming on. Duke of Mischief is right there too. Our Dark Knight and Pulsion. Three quarters went out in 111 flat. They're into the stretch, and it's Tackleberry very in front, soaring empire to the outside. Tis way between horses. Rule is down on the inside. And then comes Jackson, Ben, and Duke of Mischief. Can Tackleberry hold on? Tackleberry on the inside. Tis way, soaring empire. Here's the finish. Tackleberry again. Then either soaring empire or Tisway, and Duke of Mischief was fourth.
This portion of the program brought to you by Capital Bets. For more information, go to CapitalOTB.com. Catch the excitement with Capital OTB Online. It's now easier than ever with internet wagering at CapitalOTB.com. Wager online and get track odds, online contests, membership specials, and it's secure and fan-friendly. Whether it's a big stakes day like the Kentucky Derby, Belmont Stakes, Traverse Stakes, Breeders' Cup, or just a great day of racing, wagering online at CapitalOTB.com is always simple and easy. Sign up today at CapitalOTB.com because your chances are better with Capital OTB. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. Mike Veach to my left. I'm Mark Asano. Our thanks once again to Donnie Von Hemmel for joining us. And Tackleberry, the horse of the meet thus far Agreed. at Gulfstream. Agreed. Wins his third stakes there at three different distances as he gamely holds off Soaring Empire, Tisway, and Duke of Mischief to win the Gulfstream Park handicap by a neck. The high-weighted 121 pounds, Tackleberry races without Lasix. For trainer Louis Oliveris, who has done a great job, and jockey Javier Santiago. All right, final guest this morning. He trained Spain when she was a two-year-old. He has one of the finest sprinters in the country in Smiling Tiger, the multiple stakes winner, who was third in last year's Breeders' Cup Sprint. But this morning, we're going to talk to him about his exciting three-year-old Colt Swayaway, who makes his two-turn debut in this afternoon's Rebel Ladies and gentlemen, joining us live via telephone from Oaklawn Park, Mr. Jeff Bondi. Jeff, Mark, and Mike welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. Thank you very much. Hi Good again, Jeff. Well, Jeff, and Hi, I'm how are you? Good, how are you? And, and, and as importantly, how's the Colt doing? Um, he's had a smooth trip over here. We brought three horses, and all three horses seem to be doing very well. So we're, we're, we're optimistic, everything. I'm ready to go. That's wonderful. <clears throat> Jeff, in a moment, our audience is going to watch his fine second in last August's Best Pal at Del Mar. And for our audience, he is number six, last at the top of your screen. Jeff, if you would, talk about his limited two-year-old campaign and why he was away for six months after this race. Um, he started his career in my... Uh home base, which is not where I live, in Pleasant, um, and uh, he was, you know, spectacular in his first race, very dominant, had a big finish, and uh, we took him to Del Mar, he trained well, um, and he ran a good race to be second, but I thought he had excuses in the race, he kind of ducked away from a Hollendorfer horse in the middle of the turn, and uh, kind of lost his momentum and shuffled back, and then he came with a run. He came out of the race with a ranch knee. There was a little micro lake in the top of the capsule. Could have left it, but I took it out um, and gave him some time off and trained very well through his uh, first race back at Santa Anita and, and, and rewarded us with a very good race. Yes, and we will watch that in, in just a moment. Jeff, you know, he debuted at Pleasanton, as you mentioned, and, and that is a little bit out of the ordinary. Was the timing just 
just right as far as getting him started there? Well, that's my home base, as I say, and uh, it's important for me to win races in my hometown, um, and we like to start a lot of our two-year-olds there. If you look our history up, uh, a lot of our good horses have made their initial starts there. Mm. Jeff, there's been a couple of recent articles written about Sway Away yeah. and his appearance, yeah. the, the way he looks. Could you take a moment and please describe him for our audience from a physical standpoint? Um, he's a very attractive horse. Uh, he's very well made, very correct. Um, we call him the panda bear because he looks like one. <laughs> and uh, very gentle. I mean, you could have your kids around him. He's a very laid back horse. He's not a type A like a smiling tiger. Um, so he, he's nice to be around. Uh, but he's very well built. Um, his drawback is that he's a sway back. Yeah. And uh, there's been. Many good horses over the years that were sway back, um, honor and glory, and for one. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's how he was an affordable horse in the old sales. The fact that he was sway back. Jeff, in spite of the fact that he's a sway back, you know I've watched all his races on video a number of times. It looks like his action is very good, and, and for some sway backs, their action are terrible. But he looks like his action is very smooth. He's got a very long reach, and he can quicken uh, as good as anything I've had. Um, that's, that's his uh, strong suit. Well, let's watch him quicken in the San Vicente. Uh, as our audience takes a look, heading down the backstretch to the far turn, again, he'll be last at the top of the screen, but he's going to put in an impressive rally to finish second. Jeff, talk about this performance, if you would, please. Uh, I was very excited because I was, uh, being the fact that he's a large horse, I was concerned that he might be a work short, but uh, Garrett Gomez has been working him each week, and he assured me that he felt he was tight, and I guess he was right. And my doubts were, you know, not subscribed, but uh, the horse, uh, he, his second quarter, he went in a slow first quarter, and he just let him gather himself. But his second quarter uh, on the sheet things that people print out, um, he went 20 and 3. I'm sure that caught his air to make that kind of move. Uh, at the head of the lane, I still thought he had a slight chance to win, but the other horse had done enough to hold us off. Now, Jeff, we know that it's one thing to close off a 43 and 2 half going 7 8, but today he tries something for the very first time two turns, 8 and a half furlongs. Your thoughts about that? Well, I've always thought that this horse would be better going two turns to set a degree strictly to route. Um, I've heard people say he's blocky. I mean, I, I don't see that myself. I think he's a well-balanced horse. Um, and he's always finished. Um, he's been one of them horses that's like a lassie's errand with anaerobic air, the way I see it. Um, I, I just think he'll have the answer today when it's crunch time, so we'll see. Jeff, do you expect him to move forward off the San Vicente? I think he can only get better. Um, lightly raced horse, but you know, hopefully the glass has still got a lot more to pour. Give our audience an idea. Let's assume for a moment the factor goes the first half today in 46 and change. I'm not sure he can go that slow, but let's say he goes 46 and change. How close to that type of pace would you expect your colt to be? Um, well, I've spent the last few days analyzing and reanalyzing this race because it's a large field, but they've had a couple, you know, uh, come out of the race now, and a couple of those were pace type horses. Um, so uh, I'm sure Bob is enjoying that. Uh, yeah. But my horse, uh, he just, uh, he'll get into his rhythm, and uh, wherever he's comfortable, that'll be fine with me. I, I don't expect him to be back as far today as he was in the uh, San Vicente, um, but that'll come down to Garrett Gomez. Uh, put a lot of time in on the horse, and you never take the keys to the car away from a rider because it only creates a problem for you. Mm -hmm. Jeff, on the morning of March 12th, 
the same morning that the factor worked three quarters in 12 and 1, Sway Away went 7 eighths in 23 and 3. How good was that work? Um, it was absolutely spectacular. Every eighth he seemed to get faster and um, he had a good gallop out and the rider was uh, very, very pleased with the work. Jeff, what's he got to show you this afternoon in his two-turn debut for him to stay on the road to Louisville? Um, well, I'm a total believer in my horse, and um, I feel like if he goes out and runs a quality race, you know, we're definitely going to stay on that on that path. I think he has the talent um, and the pedigree uh, and the stamina, you know, to do all of these things. So we're going to find out. Jeff, before we let you go, give us a quick update on Smiling Tiger. What's going on? Uh, he came on the plane with uh, Sway Away down here. I brought three horses down here this week. Um, he won't run till the festival week in April in the Count Fleet. Uh, he worked 46th and a fifth or something uh, just before he left on the plane. Uh, he's doing very well. Jeff, can he get a mile? I mean, do you have do you have thoughts on the Met Mile? Um. In his last race, he gave me uh, every in, in, you know inclination that the horse would be able to do the one-turn mile, you know, within his scope. And his last race kind of proved that to me. I thought. Well, Jeff, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. All the best later this afternoon with Sway Away in a fascinating renewal of the Rebel, and we hope to be speaking with you again very soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Good Jeff luck, Bondi, Jeff. ladies and gentlemen. And this, in my mind, this Colt is one of the keys to this race. Yeah. Because yeah. if you go on calracing.com and you watch his race at Pleasanton and you watch the best pal again, he's not a deep closing sprinter. He had some natural speed. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the San Vicente, when they went, you know, whatever, yeah. 43 to yeah. half, you know, he was way back. But he may have a little more tactical speed than a lot of people think. I think he's one of the keys to this afternoon's yep, Rebel. Too. For all of you who sent emails and letters, we thank you. We will go over them next week. For those of you who would like to correspond with us here at Down the Stretch, here are the ways in which you can do that. Through the United States Postal Service Down the Stretch, Mark and Mike, Capital District OTB 510 Smith, Schenectady 12305, or electronically at Viewer Mail at CapitalOTB.com. Time to thank all the folks who helped get this week's show on the air. Pat Peretta directed, and Dan Hayes and Brian Dorenzo, Pete Persico, our associate producer, Julie Hoxie, and special thanks to this morning's guests, Donnie Von Hemmel and Jeff Bondi on the final official day of winter. Is there some correlation between the last official day of winter and having the village people on this morning's show. Only you could even look for something like that. How good, <laughs> <laughs> How good was that? All right, enjoy the races this weekend. Uh, it's a good day today, really, yep. Ladies and gentlemen, yep. as always, we thank you so very much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy all the racing action from coast to coast here at Capitol. Have a terrific weekend and a wonderful upcoming week. And from all of us here at Down the Stretch, we'll see you next week.